you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Psalm, chapter 77. Matter of fact, you could kind of, you, you could stay right there. We're primarily going to be there, and even in Psalm 78, kind of back and forth between the two. I'm not going to be as scripture refer, reference heavy today. In other words, it's not as many is going to appear on the screen because, I mean, it just covers such a wide range. Um, I may give you the verses real quick as, I, as I'm giving you. So, that, I mean, I'm backing all this up with Scripture. But when you go home, read Psalm 77, 78 for yourself, and you can see where all of this is being pulled from. Very, It's all being pulled from either Psalm 77, 78. I'm going to begin this morning by reading Psalm 77, verses 4 through 6. You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I have considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. I call to remembrance my song in the night. And I meditate within my heart. And my spirit makes diligent search. This morning, and I'm excited to bring to you a message entitled, Loosing Arrows. Loosing Arrows. You may be seated. I'm going to ask you a series of questions that I believe we can all answer or that we all have grown accustomed to. Have you ever laid awake at night bothered by the events of the day? <laughs> now, I'm telling you, this is going to be a good message. I gave the title, the first question, and I'm already getting amen. This is going to be, this, we're rolling today. You might have some personal issues that seemingly will not resolve themselves or are constantly brought to your attention. You see, you could also be the type of individual who meditates on current events, wondering how we have arrived at our present destination. No matter the root cause of those thoughts or emotions, losing sleep or being troubled within ourselves has kept the vast majority of us at wake at some point in our lives. You shouldn't feel as if, as if you're some sort of weirdo or as some have may have labeled you as one who cares too much about events outside of your control. This morning I'm going to tell you, do not fear. You're in good company. The composer of this psalm is none other than Asaph. Basically, he was the worship leader for the temple during the reigns of both David and Solomon. So he saw not only two separate kings or, or reigns, but he also saw the transition between two leaderships. But like many of you, Asaph has recorded for us that he too had trouble sleeping due to various events he had witnessed. You see, Asaph saw the rise and the splendor of the kingdom during the reign of David, but recognized how far it had digressed under the reign of Solomon. Now, many would note how they thought, or you're thinking right now, Paul, you, you, you've gotten it backwards. Under Solomon, the kingdom expanded, and it became the wealthiest kingdom during the reign of Solomon which is a true statement. But what Asaph recognized that caused his insomnia was the, was the digression of the spiritual condition of the nation. You see, certainly the kingdom had expanded and growth could not be denied, but at what cost? You see, whether we realize it or not, that is what has caused the Spirit of God within many believers to be stirred recently. It is the recognition of how far we have actually fallen spiritually as a nation. Look with me, Psalm 78, verse 57. But turn back and acted unfaithfully like their fathers. They turned aside like a deceitful bow. Now as Asaph laid on his bed and he began to ponder the condition of the nation, of all the analogies that he could have chosen, 
All the illustrations he, he, could have, he could have penned for us. He compared the nation, he compared the people to being a deceitful bow. Which makes little to no sense to us until you consider further Scripture. You see, one who would wield a bow was almost invaluable during a battle. Because they could launch those arrows from a distance and take out multiple adversaries. You see, when, when King David was running from Saul, it says, and, and Scripture says it, and it was written that there was a select, a, a, listen to me, a select few. He called them mighty men that, that, that followed very closely to David. And not only were they considered to be mighty men, but he gave a very distinct uh, description in that text when he said that these select few who were mighty, he said they were skilled at two things, the bow and the sling. But not only were they skilled with a bow and a sling, but Scripture indicates, and it's found in First Chronicles, it says that these men were not only skilled with a bow and arrow, but they could use either hand. They were amphibious. Y'all have got to wake up. I know it's ambidextrous. Okay, I, I, I know. But I'm just testing you. You got it. The one who said that um, Howard is, is God's name. <laughs> a warrior who was skilled with the bow and an arrow was extremely valuable during his time. Here's what we must consider so that we can understand what Asaph is telling us or trying to teach us this morning. Is we must understand the construction of a Middle Eastern bow during this time. You see, the Eastern bow at rest is curved backwards like the one on the right, the unstrung bow. You see, it is contrary to the bend that it must have when the bow is strung, the one on the left. So, here's what has to happen for the bow to even be used or in the process of stringing. They say that the bow must be recurved. Recurved. You see, if a person is unskillful or weak in trying to string that bow, that bow would, would spring back and, could, and it was strong enough that it could break the arm of the person trying to string it. If a bow is not made well, it might fly back when the archer is trying to discharge or loose the arrow. You see, it was a bow... And when he's saying uh, a deceitful bow, he's given us the imagery that it is a bow that cannot be trusted in battle and that this bow would then also disappoint the archer in whose hands the bow had been placed. Notice that Asaph did not place at this time the blame on the arrows, but rather on the bow. You see, as the construction of the bow is ultimately responsible for the direction of the arrow. You see, the Bible teaches us that the fathers are the bows, while the children are oftentimes represented and are, and are called arrows. So Asaph was not placing all the blame on Solomon, though, and don't misunderstand what I'm saying, each and every one of us are responsible for our own actions. He wasn't placing all the blame on Solomon as much as considering how much David had influenced the life and the decision making of Solomon. You see, Asaph also did not place the sole responsibility on any individual as uh, this imagery, and you'll see it in the context of Scripture, was directed towards the nation of Israel as a whole. Because what kept him up at night? How far the nation had turned away from God. So it becomes easy, or can become easy, for a bunch of bows to blame the arrows for misbehavior. 
it is very easy for an older generation to blame a younger generation for how far or how deep a nation has digressed. When Asaph is self, we have no reason to look any further than let's look at the fathers. You see, in Psalm 78 verse 57, let's look again. But turn back and acted unfaithfully like their fathers. So Asaph immediately went back and said, look, the reason why the children are doing what they're doing, we need to go back and look at the daddies. The reason why the nation has digressed and the reason why we're beginning to see things escalate, and I'm going to get into this a little bit deeper here in a moment, trying to stay off of it. The reason why we have seen recent events in the news, yes, we are responsible for our own actions, but where were the fathers? Where was the guidance? You see, the children have been unfaithful because the fathers themselves have been unfaithful. Now, I'm not going to put all the blame on men. We all share. Remember, he's talking about a nation. Men, women, we all share in this alike. But he's saying that the reason why the children are unfaithful to the house of God Let's look at how faithful the fathers are to the house of God. If the children have been unfaithful in reading the Word of God, then has the father and the mother been making an emphasis to read the Word of God to their children or in front of their children? Have they been praying for their children and in front of their children? Because what they see on the regular, what they begin to see in their household, what is important in the household is what the child will say should be important in my life. So when people no longer make the house of God important, then the next generation will say the house of God is of no importance. When we say prayer is not important and prayer meeting has no power and it has no place in today's church or society or culture, when we do not make prayer, then we're telling another generation that we don't need a relationship with God. We don't need to intercede for our nation. You see, here's what began to happen. You see this pattern throughout Scripture. Every time... God was about to do something for the nation, He would send them a different leader. He would send them Moses. Moses led them out of their captivity. Joshua led them out of captivity and into the promise. David is the one who took the nation and would begin to fight battles that the previous generation didn't want to fight. So you begin to see these different leaders begin to rise up when God was about to do a new thing. You would see different leaders begin to rise up Oh, man. You know, when I say this, we would say it is, a very, it is very tragic when we see a lot of the, when I say this, a lot of the ministers that have passed recently because we look at them. Because my thing, my thing, because y'all know I love some David Wilkerson. And when you go there and you begin to read his writings, I'm sitting there thinking to myself, God, you gave that man a special gift. And back in the late 60s, you gave him a word of what would happen at the end times. And Lord, we're seeing these things happen now. And, I, and in my mind, I'm sitting here thinking to myself, Lord, why would you let a man like David Wilkerson pass from the face of this earth? And not see the fulfillment of what you spoke to him in the 60s and 70s. Why would you not? And, I, and I'm going to be honest with you because as you begin to move into a new phase, it is time for some other arrows to be launched. It is time. See, God has to, that is, it's hard for us to understand this because we're not God. And in his sovereignty, he realizes if I don't remove some of this, uh, this older generation, the younger generation is going to say, all I got to do is go to a David Wilkerson. All I got to do is go to grandma. All I got to do is go to my mom and ask them to pray for me or go get a word. And God said, no, I want you to come to me. I want you to pray to me. I want you to, you want a word, you go to God. Look, he's got, sometimes some of these ministers have to be removed out of the way because God has to make room for a new voice. Because see, there are people who will not give other people a chance or an opportunity. Because, oh no, while I can still listen to Wilkerson, and while I can still listen to these, I have no need to listen to these people over here. I don't know why I went there, but each time God gives us a leader. And I believe we're getting ready to see some leaders rise up, and I mean true biblical leaders, who will preach and teach the truth of the Word of God no matter where it lands them. No matter whether they stand in front of a crowd or not. You see, each time, God would take the time. You see it here in the psalm. 
Not only would He send them a leader, but before they would go into the next phase, God would begin to remind them, let me tell you of what I've already done for you. Let me remind you of everything I've already done. Let me remind you of what I'm doing for you today, but I don't want you to forget what I promised for your future. You see, we go through season of changes. We begin to see new leaders rise up. We don't understand it. We begin to see, uh, and remember I'm talking about the spiritual state. We begin to see new spiritual leaders begin to rise up. True leaders. Founded on the Word of God. We don't understand it. Then we go through a period of time when we begin to hear messages. We begin to read in our devotion books. Or we find ourselves when we do the Word of God, things begin to come back up. God is taking that time. Let me remind you that I'm God. Let me remind you of what I've already done for you and done for this church. Let me remind you of the times I've healed you. Let me remind you of the times I've set you free. And I've taken those words from your mouth or I've taken that addiction off your body. Let me remind you of the time that when you began to pray and you, oh God, I need to be healed because something's going on in my body and the doctors in low and mess, modern medicine has no clue. And God says, I brought you up off that bed. I breathed new life back into you. I removed cancer from your body. Look, you've had a stroke, but you've had no effects because God is the one who opened up the bloodways. He began to bypass those vessels that He had created in your body because He said, let me remind you I'm God. Look, but here's what happens in Scripture. When the third generation arises, so there could be a pattern. We're not getting into it. That's not the purpose of this message today. But every third generation, when that third generation arises, they begin to forget everything that God has said and done. And what do they do? They become unfaithful like a previous generation. That's what Asaph is talking about. What did these generations do? All this is found in Psalm 78. I'm just going to give you the verse. So for those who take notes, this is all found in Psalm 78. And I'm just picking, when I say this, there are many there. I'm giving you the ones I feel like the Spirit of God, they just stood off the page at me. Because I really believe that's where the, 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 a lot of Christians are at today. First one is found in verse 18. Because what it says is that what they did as a nation is that they would begin to test God. They tested God. How would they test God? Well, remember, they're walking in a desert. And after a while, you get thirsty. Oh God, if we just had water to drink. So God calls water to come out of a rock. How many have you ever seen, and I'm not talking about a natural spring coming from the mountain. You put a rock out here in the middle of this floor. How many have you ever seen water coming out of a rock? But God calls water to come out of a rock to do what? Quench their thirst. But that wasn't enough for them. Oh no. They still had to complain. They still had to mumble and grumble. Oh, Lord, man, there was some good bread back in Egypt. We could put some, slap some honey butter on that thing, and it was better than them rolls at Texas Roadhouse. We're hungry. We love some bread to eat. Well, God calls it in the morning when they woke up. The only thing they had to do was go out and pick it up off the ground. It fell like dew, covered the ground. And it wasn't just any bread. It was bread from heaven, manna. But, like most people, what happens? Ah, oh, we're tired of bread. You know, we're meat and potatoes people. Matter of fact, we're Pentecostal. We love some fried chicken. Now, they didn't ask for fried chicken. Y'all know that. Oh, God, that water's good. Causes that bread to swell up in my belly. But man, if we just have some meat to eat. Oh, man, we need some meat. We need something but be with this bread. We need something to put in look from the side. We need something to put in between the bread. And so what did God do? He caused the wind to come up and blew quail in. And the other thing they had to do was pick the quail up. Here is the issue and the problem. We continue to test the boundaries of a long suffering, merciful God. That's what they did. The water wasn't enough. The bread wasn't enough. The quail being blown in wasn't enough. They had to keep pushing. They had to keep trying God. And that's what we've done as a church and that's what people have done as this nation. 
We have been founded on Judeo-Christian beliefs, but you know what? That wasn't enough. God give us a nation that you could say was flowing with milk and honey. There are a lot of natural resources here. That wasn't enough. Greed continues to slip in. That's not enough. We become one of the wealthiest nations on the face of the earth, but you know what? All of that wealth wasn't enough. We become the greatest military on the face of the earth, but that wasn't enough. We continue to push the boundaries of God. In what way have we done that? Oh, you know what? We don't want to offend nobody. I just feel it rising up in me. Y'all just might as well hold on for this one. You got a seatbelt, put it on. This one will probably get pulled down. I don't care. Let me go ahead and tell you how we tested God as this nation. Oh, I don't want to offend anybody. So we're going to pull prayer out of school. The only name that can move mountains, the only name that can heal the sick, the only name that can cause revival to happen, and we want to take Him out of our schools, and we wonder why these events happen in our schools. We're praying for those people in Texas and, and in Buffalo and all those, and it is very tragic. But when you took the God of the universe out of school, and His name out of that school, then you've opened it up for every demonic attack to come to that school. We continue to test the boundaries of our God. That wasn't enough. Then we go and decide, you know what? Taking His name out of our town square, removing the Ten Commandments from our courthouses, that's not enough. You know what we have to do now? We have to kill them before they're born. By the legalization of abortion. We have shed innocent blood on this land and that blood is crying out to God. Look, not only is that enough, but now, look, it's bad enough they want to kill them in the womb. But now we're saying, you know what? If, 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 two years down the road, if you don't like that baby, you know what? That's fine. We euthanize them. A two-year-old toddler. God, help us from continuing to test your long-suffering and your mercy, your boundaries. If that's not enough, Isaiah says that I spoke over you while you were in the matrix of your mother's womb. Our God makes no mistakes. He created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. He created us to be male and female. And God makes no mistakes. Whatever happens in that womb, in the matrix of our mother's womb, whether it's male or female, that's what, that, that is the, uh, the sexual orientation God needed us to be. But now that ain't enough. Oh, look, you're having a little boy. Oh, you really want a girl? Well, now we can go in and read Gene, and we can change, and we can do, because we know better than God. We continue to test the boundaries of the Almighty and wonder why the blessings of God's not flowing in this nation. Let me tell you what they've done, because this was found in verse 56. Same thing we're doing. It says that they provoked him. See, even though God gave them a leader, even though God, uh, and I, I'm getting to something in a minute, just hang with me. Even though God not only has raised up spiritual leaders, and even though God has blessed us richly and abundantly above all we could ever ask or think, according to His Word, according to His grace and His mercy, we continue to rebel against God. And here's where the testing of the boundaries gets dangerous. To provoke not only means that we rebel against God, but we continue to push until we move God to action. That is where this is dangerous. Because a nation that continues to provoke the God of the universe will continue to push the God of the universe to a point that He has no other action or recourse but to act. They wanted meat. God sent them enough quail to it made them sick and killed some of them. I read this quote this week. And I think it's very fitting. Sometimes God's greatest judgment, His greatest judgment, is to give us what we want. They wanted quail, He gave them quail. They, gave them, he want, they wanted water, He gave them water. They wanted bread, He gave them bread. Till they come out their ears. You see, 
We as a nation are never satisfied. I'm still talking spiritual. We're never satisfied. We continue to push the boundaries of God. We continue to until we provoke Him to action. But at the same time, let me go ahead and tell you what God does sometimes. The greatest judgment He's going to send us, He's going to give us exactly what we ask for. Remember, what did the nation of Israel do? He wanted them to look to Him for their answers and to worship Him alone. But see, that wasn't enough. Now, oh, no, we want to be like everybody else in the world. We want a king. So he said, okay, there's Saul. Let's see how you like it. He continued to push and continue, and they continued to put, Look, we saw successive over, what, nine generations of different kings that would come in, and they would continue to, to bring this nation down until it made God act. And he says, well, now what I told Moses back in, in the Torah, that if you continue to provoke me, I'm going to have to send you in exile. And he, they continued until God rose up a king. Nebuchadnezzar is my servant, says Scripture. And he brought up a pagan king of a pagan nation to come and to pull his people into exile and to take that nation over. Sometimes we do not know what we're asking for. And then when we get what we're asking, well, man, I don't like this. This isn't what I, this isn't what I thought it would be. See, a nation can reach a limit in which God has no recourse but to act. And then this is the biggest travesty I think that the church is doing, verse 41. Not that the others aren't bad in themselves, but this is the worst one. They limited God. They limited God. See, they have forgotten what they had seen. They have forgotten what they had heard. That generation rose up, they've forgotten everything that God had done for them in Egypt. How He brought them out, saved them from the death angel. They for, see, they forgot all that. They've forgotten all the deliverances of God. You see, they should have been able to trust God in any situation because they knew that God was in control of every situation. They should have had faith enough in God, but no, they limited God. And that's what the church is doing. Spurgeon made this quote, and this is very, this, this, hits, this should hit home. We are too prone to engrave our trials in marble, but our blessings in in sand. You see, we're too quick to take a hammer and chisel and begin to beat into some marble. Oh man, this has happened in my life and this one forsaken me. And we keep bringing that stuff back up because it's right there, it's permanent. But anything God has done for us is like writing in the sand. The wind blows and the sand covers it up. If you do it on the, uh, make the engraving on the beach, what happens? The waves come up. You know, different troubles come up where well, they wash and smooth it back out and you go back, you can't see what you've written. You see, we're, we're too easy to give credit to the adversary. Oh man, he, he's beating me down again. He, he's dragging me through again and look at the waves that are buffeting me, the things that are coming against me. Rather, what we should be doing is all the blessings of God, which are yes and amen, should be engraved in our minds and our hearts so we never forget. See, that's the problem with this nation, and Ronald Reagan warned us about it. The, when we finally get to a generation who never remembers things like Memorial Day or Fourth of July, the sacrifices of men and women, then we will be a nation done under. And so when a church begins to forget all that Jesus Christ had done for them, the stripes on his back, the blood that was, the, the spear in the side, the spinning, the pulling of his beard. When a church begins to forget about the power of Jesus Christ and how he was resurrected, and is now at the right hand of the Father in heaven making intercession. See, when we begin to forget those things, then we become a nation or a body of believers that will be done under. Because then when the adversary comes against us, and he will, and he comes against us, we will be defeated. We will be done under. But the people who engrave the name of God on their mind and on their heart, the people who remember all the battles that God has fought for them. <coughs> when the battle continues to intensify and it continues to get stronger and we go back to, the, to those memorials and we begin to say, oh man, look at the sacrifice that He made for me. Oh, if it had not been for Jesus Christ. Where would I be at today? Look at all He's done for me. How He's uh, saved me. How He's raised me. How He's blessed me. 
by the power of the Spirit of God. He's done all these things. Then we cannot be a nation done under. Let's get back to the bow. I'm trying. Hosea 7, 16. They return, but not to the Most High. They are like a, he calls them a treacherous bow. You see, a bow, when properly constructed, will never lose its shape, even unstrung. It'll, it'll stay the same recurve or curvature shape. It only recurves once the string has been set, and then the bow, the arms of the bow, remain under the tension of the spring, of the string. The idea that Hosea, the prophet, is giving of the nation of Israel, and think about it, put the imagery of the bow back up again. When you look at the unstrung bow, you would be standing here holding that bow. The arms of the bow curving away from you. When it is strung, the arms of the bow curve back. Hosea the prophet is given the imagery that Israel, when bent towards God, in other words, they're following God, they're going after God, once they revoke the blessings of God, that third generation, they turn back and they begin to be like their fathers, unfaithful, and those types of things. They become the unstrung bow. And they turn back away from God. Back away from the archer. You see, it is more than simply turning from God. What He says they're doing, they're going back to their sinful nature. They're going back to their natural state. You see, how would they do such things? The psalmist writes in Psalm 78, 36, they flattered Him with their mouth and they lied to Him with their tongue. We know Scripture says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. As long as their heart was steadfast towards God, they would speak the praises and the blessings of God. They were resolute. They were diligent. They were unwavering in their purpose as long as they stayed bent towards God. You see, many people give no thought to what we say. James says that life and death is in the power of the tongue. We give no thought towards what comes out. Because what many of us do, we make statements about things that we either don't mean or we make vows that we have no intention on keeping. And we've all been there and done it. Let me tell you how. Lord, I am in a jammy jam right now. I don't know how I got here. Well, let me tell you how he got there. He turned away from God. And he tried to do it under the only strength of power instead of seeking God for his wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. But anyway, Lord, I am in a jammy jam that I have never been in before. I promise if you'll get me out of this jam this time, I'll never do it again. How many prayed that prayer? Oh, man, come on. Me, me and one other person. We've all prayed it. We've all said that. Oh, God, if, if you do this, see, y'all didn't think I was going to open my eyes. I got y'all. You see, we make things and we say things and we make vows and we make promises that we may have the best intention, but we ain't gonna, look, one, if we can make the promise or the vow, we can't keep it within our own strength anyway. You can ask God to be Lord and Savior of your life, but if it wasn't for the power and Spirit of God, you couldn't keep that promise. So we make flattering to us. We say things to God, oh Lord. Here, you know, we do it on Sunday. We're good about doing it on Sunday morning, but then we get the rest of the week. What else is coming out of our mouth? They remained unfaithful. Exodus 20, verse 27 says, Therefore, son of man, speak to the house of Israel, say to them, Thus says the Lord God, In this too your fathers have blasphemed me by being unfaithful to me. Very simple. We've been talking about it. That generation was unfaithful because the fathers had been unfaithful. You see, what they began to do was offer up false sacrifice and false worship. We know the story of the widow's might. She gave all she had, but she did it in the right spirit. You can cut a check for a million dollars and put it in the offering bucket, and if you will, make it payable to Tree of Life Ministries. 
But if it's not given in the right intent, it is a false offering. If you say, I, God, I have done this for you. Why did you do it for God? Were you doing it to be seen of men? Were you doing it to get the big old pat on the back? If so, then that was a false sacrifice. You see, these people had turned to idol worship. Anything that gets between us and our God is an idol. Something as simple as social media in the hands of a lot of people has become an idol. Something as simple as, you know, I mean, we could, we could go down the list. There's no need to go because I'm getting ready to get into the good right here in a minute. But we got to quit the idol worshiping. There's only one God. And He's worthy of all praise, honor, and glory. We cannot be like our fathers or those of the past. Why? In order, because when you put an idol up, you are believing in something or trying to place your faith into something. And by erecting an idol, you're believing that God can't do it. That's what you're saying by turning to everything else but Him first. But I don't want to keep harping on this. Psalms 127 verse 4. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. At times I find myself like Asaph. I lie there, I ponder what's going to happen next in this nation. How much further must we digress before we awaken to our corrupt state as a nation? We wonder how long will God suffer with such insolence? But unfortunately, the further we travel down the rabbit hole, the more we must dig to climb back out. The longer evil is able to abound within this nation, the weaker the arrows become, if there are any arrows remaining at all. I'm going to give you something, a conversation Stephanie and I had, and it just, it just rings. I know that Scripture says that the lawless one will not appear until the restrainer is removed. And I know this is a direct reference that the lawless one being the Antichrist, the restrainer is the church. I don't have time to teach that. But the restrainer is the church, not the Holy Spirit. The rapture has not yet occurred because the church is still here. Now, like many of you, I too have made this statement that a spirit, listen, a spirit, not a person, physical person, but the spirit of Antichrist has been loosed in this world. And I still agree with that statement. Here's the part that struck me this week in our conversation. I believe that the reason much evil is abounding is due to the lack of spiritual warriors on the face of this earth. You see, those, and when I say the lack of, generations who are not skilled and able to handle the bow with either hand. Those in whom the Scriptures say would consider a mighty man or woman of God. Notice, how the arrows are most effective when they've been placed in the hands of a warrior. People who have become skilled in handling bows and arrows. People who are willing to do whatever it takes. Uh, to, to, and when I say whatever it takes, they begin to loose the prayers of intercession into the atmosphere. Those are some of the arrows that we're shooting. Those who are simply willing to take the time with the next generation of arrows. In other words, let me impart to you what I have learned over my life. Let me impart to you what my God says according to His Word. I am of the belief that there are still bows and there are still arrows on this earth. And I truly believe we have been in a season in which God has been, has been preparing mighty men and mighty women of God who will be able to handle the bow with either hand. They're, silly, they're, 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 they're not willing to satisfy or, or simply uh, want to take up the mantle of a previous generation. 
And they're not satisfied with trying to live under an old anointing. He has been training up warriors for one final engagement. Come on now. You, you, uh, stay with it, Paul. I'm trying. Psalm 77, verse 6. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I meditate within my heart and my spirit makes diligent search. See, when you have you ever been there and you've been lying awake at night pondering, oh God, how much longer? Oh God, when is revival going to break out? Oh God, you know, you know this family member's come to my mind and I'm praying about them. But let me tell you what also happens with a warrior. Because see, a true warrior who can handle the bow with either hand and can throw uh, slings, use a sling with either hand, they're, they're very few in number. There's not many of them, but there's mighty men. Let me tell you what they happen when they lay down. I said they got a different spirit about them than, than other people have. Because, see, they lay down at night. They do find themselves from time to time asking that same question. But here's what they do. As they lay there and they begin to pray to God, and they begin to lift up intercession, and they begin to shoot those, those arrows of praise unto God and prayer out to God, let me tell you what happens to those types of warriors. It is in the middle of the night or early in the morning when they begin to wake up from their slumber and from their sleep. Let me tell you what begins to happen. You begin to wake up and you begin to hear in your mind you be, the songs. These are the days of Elijah declaring the Word of our Lord. How great is our God. Oh, sing with me how great is our God. Our Lord is great and greatly to be praised. You may get up and have the song in your mind saying, He's under my feet. He's under my feet. Look, I don't know what song comes to you in your season because it depends on what you're going through. depends on the song that the Spirit of God places in your mind. But you find yourself waking up singing a song of praise and adoration unto God. See, that is beginning to be the spirit of the warrior. You're not just concerned about what's going on. You're just not praying about what's going on. You begin to pray to the name and to the God that can make something happen about what's going on. You see, let me tell you why God gives you a song in your slumber and your sleep. It's the same as when David played on the harp before Saul. Before Saul his spirit was vexed by many spirits. David would begin to play that harp and the spirits would have to leave and, he, and, and Saul would begin to calm down. He would begin to relax. You know, you've heard, we've heard the phrase in times past, he would chill out. And then, then he would be good for a season. You see, the situation remained the same. But it's in the midnight hour. In the, in, in, at 3 o'clock in the morning. Three, I find myself between 3 and 6 o'clock in the morning. Which was the same time Jesus Christ prayed in the garden. I find myself sometimes I wake up at 6 and I got a song going through my head. You see, you begin to break out in your own private praise and worship service unto God. Because God knows what's going on in your spirit. He knows what's stirring up in you. And He said, well, boy, I got to get you calmed down. Because I need you in the fight. I got, look, sometimes it's that song that begins to make those demons run. It begins that song that God uses to begin to break up the plans of the adversary. I don't know about you, but I need some things to leave. I need some things to leave my family alone. And if it requires me to sing to my God, then get ready. I'm going to cut a tune. Look, it's when things appear their darkest. Praise comes from the spirit of a warrior. Asaph began to sing in the midnight hour when it was dark and he was laying on his bed and could not sleep. I don't know about you, but spiritually in this nation, it can't get much darker than what it is right now. When is the song going to exude from the church? When is the song of the living God going to come from the spirit of His warriors? When is the church going to stand up and let His voice be heard and say, This is my God. He is great and greatly to be praised. I will sing praises unto my God. Who is this King of glory who is coming in? The Lord who is strong and mighty. Mighty in battle. Mighty in power. We got, look, church, you got to learn your song. You got to begin to sing. Let me tell you some of the questions of Asaph. You've asked these questions yourself. You see, you find it right there at the beginning of verse, uh, chapter 77. He asked about five or six questions here. I'm going to ask these same questions. Will the Lord cast off forever? Will He be favorable no more? Has His mercy ceased forever? 
Has His promises failed forever? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has He, in anger, shut up His tender mercies? I'm just going to cut to the chase this morning because that's what I feel like doing. I got something else I got to give you. Because let me give you the answers. Has God cast us off forever? Absolutely not. He is merciful. He is long. Thank God He is long-suffering. He has not cast us off forever. He's waiting. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray and seek my face, I will forgive their sins. I will heal their land. He's waiting for the warriors to stand up or fall humbly before Him and say, Oh God, forgive us of our sins and the sins of our fathers. Has He cast us off forever? No. Will He be favorable? Absolutely yes. His favor will be on those who seek Him. His favor will be on the mighty warriors. His favor, look, He said you'll be the head and not the tail. The only way we can get to the head out of this thing is by the favor of God. Has His mercy ceased? No. I thank God His mercies are renewed every single day of my life. Look, has He failed? No, He is a God who cannot fail. He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. Look, nothing escapes His sight. He can direct us just by the movement or the twinkling of His eye. He can move and direct His people. So has He ever failed? No. Everything He says that He was going to do, our God has done. You don't believe me? Go back and look at His Word for yourself. He has not fell a slight concerning not one promise. Has He shut them up? Absolutely not. Because even in the first 42 months of tribulation, in His mercy, He's still trying to get people saved. So no, He's not, uh, he's not shut up mercies. But let me give you something that Asaph gave. Chapter 77, verse 10 through 15. I love it. Because to me, it's the eye wheels of a warrior. You know, Satan gave his eye wheels, but he was trying to exalt himself. But Asaph is saying, laying on his bed, coming to the realization, let me tell you what we must do as a warrior. He says, the I wills. I will remember the years of the right hand of my God. How He's kept us, how He's got us, how He's hedged back problems. Look, I will remember everything that the hand of my God has done. How He healed me, saved me, delivered me, and set me free. I will remember the hand of my God, how I have seen Him move into situations in your families. And in the dire straits when I was standing in the hospital room with you, I will remember the hand of my God. He goes on to say, I'm going to remember the works of my God. Look what He has done from the time He spoke all this into existence and even the plan He has for the future. I'm going to remember everything. Look, if it had not been for Jesus Christ, us Gentiles would not have the chance or the opportunity to be saved and to spend eternity in, in heaven. But since the foundations of the earth, God had a plan for Jesus Christ to come back and to save all the... Look, to seek and to save both Jew and Gentile. I remember the works of my God in the land of the living. I will remember His wonders of old. Look, how He separated the Red Sea for them. How He caused the lame to walk. And if my God calls the lame to walk during the time of Christ, get ready because I think some people are going to eventually come to the church. They're going to be lame in their legs, lame in their arms, and just lame in their spiritual condition. But they're going to get up and walk out of here whole. I believe there's going to be some healings that's going to take place all under the power and the presence of God. Why? Because I remember when my God did it before, I remember as a young boy seeing things in church. Look, that I have not forgot here now at 48, 49 years old. I have not forgotten those things. I have not forgotten the powerful moves of God. And I'm praying that there is a generation that my daughter, and if Lord tarries long enough, which I ain't praying for this anytime soon, but if I am blessed with grandchildren, I pray that my children and my grandchildren can both begin to see the glory of my God moving in His people and descending again. I want them to see, Lord, that His glory come down like He never has before. I'm going to remember everything that He's already done. And here's what I'm going to do. Try to shut me up. I told you, they might kick me off Facebook, they may kick me off YouTube, but they can't shut me up. I might have to go out in the street and get a little louder. Look, I don't care where I got to go to preach the gospel message of Jesus Christ. I ain't shutting up. My God's been too good to me. I've got to praise the one not only who called me out, but has already done a mighty work in me. I'm not who I used to be because of Him. So why are we as a church, 
and I'm talking about universal body of believers, why do we let 1% of the population in the United States have the loudest voice to promote their agendas, which are everything contrary to the Word of God? But we as Christians want to sit back and be meek and mild and quiet and humble and, and just let everybody walk on us like a rug. I ain't nobody's rug. I'm a child of the King. I'm royalty. We're royalty. It's time for them to quit walking on us like a rug. Look, they want to take the rainbow and all its colors and let it stand for LGBTQ and whatever else comes up in the alphabet. But my God says, I have put that rainbow in the sky as a covenant that I will never destroy the earth by water again. There's a rainbow that encircles His, his emerald throne in heaven as the 24 elders are seated around His throne and the, and the living creatures are singing, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty. They cannot defile what my God has created. I thought I was going to you know, a bunch of people that, whew, we got to declare it to the next generation. Isaiah 49 verse 2. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. And in the shadow of His hands He hid me. He made me a polished arrow. And in His quiver He hid me away. I just got to give it to you how it was given to me this morning. I pray I make sense out of it. We know in the previous verse it says that God has spoken over us in the matrix of our mother's womb. That's the previous verse. Then he says, I've now made you a polished arrow. Let me tell you what they do with that. The bow is important because the bow, the, the bow determines the power that is transferred into the arrow. But let me tell you about the arrows. And this is just real quick. After they carve them out, they take and they roll them on extremely flat tables to see if there's any warp in the arrow. If they can carve it out, they carve it out. If they can't carve it out, the arrows discard it and they go on to the next arrow because they want this thing to fly true because it's, it's going to be used in battle. Here's the other thing they do. They put their fixed arrowhead to the end. That's the little sharpie end of it. I know I'm giving you all these technical terms. But they take that arrowhead and they run it on those stones until that thing becomes razor sharp because they want it to penetrate. Uh, and look, and the edges have to be at a certain geometry. The point has to be at a certain geometry because they need it to penetrate these bronze shields that they were going to fight in battle. But here's what I, this is what I felt this morning. Let me, let me give you this, I'll give you the second one. The prophet says, or he follows up by saying, he has made you a select arrow. A select arrow. You see, the arrow was placed in a place of protection. It's put in the quiver. That's where all the arrows are gathered. And then he pulls an arrow out and places it on the bow. But when he places it on the bow, it's knocked onto the string. The arrow sits on a rest. Hold on to that thought. So the arrow rests on the bow. The archer then pulls the string back. The tension is on the bow. The tension is on the string. But there is no tension on the arrow at this time because the arrow is sitting on the rest. The transference of power does not come until the archer releases the string. When he lets go of the string, the tension built up in the bow and in that string is then transferred and that's what sends the arrow into flight. I want to give you something that, that hit me this morning. The book of Ephesians, and I'm giving this just real quick. It says, that we're given the shield of faith to quench what? All the fiery darts of the adversary, all his fiery arrows. And there are three, basically three types of arrows that we're fought with. That's not for this message. Here's the thought that came to my mind. The adversary cannot originate anything. He's only an imitator of what God is already doing. So I began to think about that in Scripture. When it says He launches fiery arrows at us against our minds, body, soul, spirit, and strength. I began to think about that. Because you have solid shaft arrows. But then you have an arrow 
that has to go through to another step, another level. And what they do is they hollow the inside of that shaft of that arrow out. They take and they fill that arrow full of oil. They wrap a rag around the end of it. That way when they launch it, they light the rag, that way when they launch it into battle, it hits the shield. That hollow arrow bursts open, throwing the oil onto the person or onto their shield. And with the rag at the end, it ignites. It puts them like, it's almost like a ball of fire. Here's the thought that hit me hard this morning when I was in here praying before service. Depending upon the assignment that we're giving and depending upon the direction that we're going or the battle that we're facing depends on the type of arrow we are. Because you got some who are just going to be solid shafts arrows and they're being launched. You got some that have to go through another step. You see... God takes the time to hollow us out. To get rid of the junk that does not resemble Him. He hollows the inside of us out. Why? So that we're vessels sanctified to the glory of our God. But then, here's what He does. Then He fills us with an oil. The Spirit of God. A fresh anointing for the assignment that we're going to. See, it can't not be old old oil in a new assignment. The new assignment requires a new anointing. But then when it hits its intended target, it bursts, catching everything on fire. Hold that thought. Because what I believe is happening, you see, first of all, why, why, why must be these arrows? First, Psalms 18, 14, He sent out His arrows and He scattered the foe. Why must we have more arrows? And why must God take the time to prepare certain types of arrows? It's time that the church become the arrows and begin to defeat enemies. It's time that we launch our prayers, our praise. It's time that when it goes out, especially under the anointing of the Spirit of God, that whatever it hits, bam, it begins to burst into fire. When you come over here and we begin to pray for this family, boom, it, it splits and it bursts into fire. See, It just doesn't affect the one individual. When that fire hit, it can hit the whole family. See, I think there's getting ready to be another level of anointing in this next move of God. Yes, individuals can be and will be saved in in, an individual basis. But I believe when it hits families, we're going to begin to see whole families saved. We're going to see whole household deliverances begin to happen and take place. That's why God says, I have to prepare you, warriors, and arrows that you launch out because it's time we defeat the enemy. <laughs> y'all must like being defeated by the enemy because y'all about the quietest people I've ever seen on the face. Maybe you got your hamburger you're going to put on the grill tomorrow on your mind. I don't care if the grill blows up. I don't care if I ever eat another hamburger. I'm ready to see what my God's getting ready to do. I'm ready to see the, en- the enemies, the spirits, and the heavenly places over this nation defeated. I'm ready to see the spirits of alcoholism and drugs defeated and removed from our families. I'm ready to see your family saved. And it's going to cause us, it requires us to be arrows. Look, what's released, the arrow is released with power. An arrow with no power will fall right at the front of the bow and hit the ground. An arrow with no power is what? No earthly good. But an arrow... Launched under the power of God. There's no telling how far that arrow is going to go. There's no telling how deep it will penetrate. If the string is weak, it falls short. An unbalanced bow, an unbalanced arrow, misses its intended target. And Asaph said here, that is the word for sin or unfaithfulness here in 77. They missed their intended target. Let me tell you the importance of arrows. Psalms 120 verse 4. Sharp arrows of the warrior with coals of the broom tree is the propagation of the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Why must we have more arrows to get a broader launch of the Word of God into this world? Arrows are required for the plan of God. That's how He gets His Word out. That's how people are affected. The more arrows that get involved, guess what? The more reward God receives the more glory He gets. 
Let me close with this. Psalm 77, verse 2. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My hand was stretched out in the night without ceasing. My soul refused to be comforted. Now remember, all this started because Asa was laying in a bed, asking himself some questions, pondering, where, how did we get here? Troubled in his spirit by, by what he had witnessed, he, didn't, he not only prayed, he remembered everything God had done. It was in this same time we mentioned earlier that the night song came to the leader of worship in the temple. Song that began to soothe his troubled mind. It was a song in the night that Asaph knew everything was going to be all right. But here's the greatest thing I don't want us to miss this. It was at that moment Asaph made his greatest gesture of all. Laying in that bed, and that's just how I see it. Laying in that bed, comfortable, warm, pondering in his mind. Song beginning in his spirit. Asa slipped both hands out from underneath the sheets. And he began to extend them to heaven. If your, your version may say, and his hands became sore. He didn't beat his hands. It, that means he lifted them. He slipped them out and lifted them. Look, he even said, I'm going to lift my hands while I know I am being heard by Him. While I know He's hearing my prayers. While I know I have His attention. I'm going to praise Him. While I know all this is going on. Look, what was He doing by laying in the bed and lifting His hands? Lord, I surrender all to You. All is Yours, God. Mind, body, soul, spirit, and strength. God, as I lift my hands and I sing this song to You in the midnight hour, I'm claiming victory in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm trusting You, God, with the outcome of this nation, God. That's the gesture Asaph put up by putting his hands up. I have to tell you this. Never thought, never, look, we're from the South. We throw a ball. We shoot a gun. But we loose an arrow. See, just prior to being loosed, I told you, the arrow is in a place of protection on the, in the quiver on the side of the archer. For a time of season, we've been in a place of protection. God has hid us, kept us from some things, some things we thought we were going to have to deal with. I'm telling you, God removed them before we had to deal with them. We have been in a place of protection. Now I have seen where we've transitioned. And I didn't see it until I saw this this week. Because the archer takes the, the arrow out. He places it on the bow. And even under all this tension, the arrow is in a place of rest. In other words, it's dormant until the power has been transferred. So we've gone from a place of protection. We now find ourselves in a season of rest. Let me tell you what that means for all of us. We are about to be loosed to our designated target. This is the season. Man, Lord, I feel this right now. This is the season in which the mighty men and women of God are going to grab their bows and we're going to loose some arrows. You might be the bow in which you affect the next generation. Or you might be an arrow yourself in which you're about to be loosed into what God has spoken over your life. And this is the season of rest that Ace of pictured in the night. But we cannot ignore, or well, we cannot be ignorant to what is happening or going on around us. But we can't allow it to stifle us. See, we remember who's in charge. We remember what He's already done. Here's what we have been, or God has been doing us. He has been preparing us to be loosed to bring Him glory. He has been preparing us as individuals and a church to be loosed so that many souls can be changed for the glory of God. I'm telling you, we are about to see some arrows take flight. 
Look, some of them may stay and take flight right in this room, hitting targets in this room. Others may leave this place because they have to be launched further, because there's greater arrows that have to be won. We're about to see the enemy of God scattered. Let me tell you, it is about time for us for arrows to be loosed. Can't hold back any longer. Time's running out. Targets are many. God's looking for some mighty men and women to don their bows and their arrows. And it's time to let's be loosed and not be confined by what man tells us we ought to, what we ought to do. If everybody please stand, every head bow, every eye closed.